In this video, we're going to continue our advanced refrigeration. We're going to talk about system leak checking and evacuation. Now, you've already done your repairs at this point after you recovered your system. But before we can recharge and start our system up, we have two additional steps we really need to take care of. First of all, you have to check for leaks. Okay, no matter how much of an expert you are on brazing, no matter how good you are with your fittings, you're eventually going to have a leak, and it's much easier to find and repair this before you charge your system than after. Systems have to be as leak-free as possible. All systems leak. Piping materials are slightly porous. There's very small leaks that are not detectable and do not affect system efficiency. Some evaporators leak right out of the factory. Some systems are critically charged, so leak tests must be performed on all systems before you evacuate there and before you charge them. So you want to start off by visually inspecting the newly assembled system. Solder joints should have no gaps. Brazes should look nice and clean. Flanged and threaded connections should be tight. Control valves should be installed properly. And all service valve covers should be in place. So. To start with, we want to pressurize the system with dry nitrogen to a pressure no higher than the lowest system test pressure. So you want to go to the evaporator or the air handler and you want to take a look at what the system test pressures are. You want to find the low side. So the lowest system test pressure is what your max nitrogen pressure should be. Allow the system to rest for five minutes and mark the needle position on the gauge manifold or write down the number. Let the system hold for as long as practical. Monitor the pressures. If the pressure drops, you have a leak because nitrogen is considered a dry, is a gas that does not expand or contract based on temperature. So there's some other leak detection methods other than the standing nitrogen test. Okay, audible leaks are large and easy to find. You can find leaks by just listening and feeling. Halide leak detectors, ultrasonic leak detectors, ultraviolet leak detectors, and electronic leak detectors. So starting off with the halide leak detector, it uses a t one of those portable propane tanks with a tip that fits onto the tank. There's a flame inside the little, um, inside this area here where my mouse pointer is. You hold the hose up along the, um, along the piping and tubing moves slowly. When a leak detector, the flame color changes. This is not recommended anymore. Um, there is, you're putting a flammable, a flame, into tight mechanical spaces. While most refrigerants will not catch fire, you do not know what's mixed with them. Ultrasonic leak detectors, um, just listen closely for the sound of escaping gas that you hear through headphones. It's basically an amplifier. Ultraviolet leak detectors are used very frequently. The contractor will put in an ultraviolet dye into the piping and let the system run for a bit, and you can actually find the leaks by using a UV light on the outside of the piping. Now, this does also have some downsides. Um, this will get into your gauge hoses. It's sometimes very impossible to tell if it's a new leak or an existing leak, but this is a really great way to find leaks. The ultraviolet dye in the system glows at the point of the leak when viewed under a UV light. Electronic leak detectors are very frequently used. This is, other than bubbles, this is one of my favorite methods. Okay, other than the nitrogen test and using soap bubbles, it's one of my favorite methods to use. Beeping frequency increases when a leak is detected. Okay, it's very quick, it's very clean. The only thing you have to worry about is if it's inside of an evaporator coil or an area where there's a lot of air flowing you will not find the leak using this method unless you stop the airflow, which is sometimes difficult to do. Newly installed systems should be leak tested with a standing pressure test. That's nitrogen. Systems should be then evacuated to the required vacuum levels. And refrigerant and nitrogen mixes cannot be recovered. 
Okay, so if you mix nitrogen in with refrigerant to do a leak test to raise the pressures on a system, you cannot recover that. That has to be dumped. Visual inspection for oil and dirt spots. If there's oil on the outside of a refrigeration line, there is a leak. Leaks can be caused by vibration or temperature variations. Okay, leak check gauge ports prior to gauge installation. You don't know how many times I find system leaks on the Schrader fittings themselves. And that's easy to take care of because you can just replace the core. And when a system is under a nitrogen charge for a leak test, one of the best ways to do is take some windshield washer fluid or some dishwashing soap mixed with water and look for bubbles. Spread it on the pipes, spray it on the pipes, look for bubbles. Um, if there's bubbles, there's leaks. It's an old method and it has worked forever. To repair leaks, okay, the EPA guidelines are changing. I mean, they currently have not changed yet and there's some questions if they will change, but systems do not require repair if they have systems with less than 50 pounds of refrigerant and some industrial and commercial systems with more than 50 pounds of refrigerant and a leak rate less than 35 percent year comfort cooling chillers that's large chiller systems with a leak rate of less than 15 percent per year and most residential systems you cannot tell a customer that you are required by law to fix the leak because you're not you can advise your customers and you're encouraged to advise your customers that a leaking system is not efficient and sooner or later it's going to cost them more to repair or replace that system than it is to fix your leak right now okay the bottom line on residential and light commercial systems and most systems with the exception of the industrial and commercial systems which are they are under such heavy use they do leak, is that a leaking system reduces efficiency. So just be aware the EPA regulations do not say that you have to fix leaks. So after we've leak checked our systems, the next thing we do is evacuation, which basically means remove the air and other impurities from the system. So air contains oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and water vapor. Nitrogen is a non-condensable gas. Non-condensables will cause a rise in the system's operating head pressure and sometimes can block parts of the condenser coil. Oxygen, hydrogen, and water vapor cause chemical reactions in the system. It produces acids that deteriorate system components and can cause copper plating. Chemical combinations can create hydrofluoric or hydrochloric acids, which will melt down compressor windings. Evacuation equals degassing and dehydration. Moisture and acid and oil cause sludge in the system. Sludge causes system components to be plugged. Proper evacuation can eliminate the formation of acid and sludge. So pulling a vacuum lowers the pressure in a system below atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is 14.696 PSIA. That's absolute pressure at sea level. Okay, so PSIA is atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure, which is known as PSIG. Okay, gauges start off at zero PSIG, but that may not be atmospheric pressure. So pulling a vacuum removes the non-condensable gases from a system, and systems should be evacuated from the high to low pressure, high and low pressure sides of the system. So when we talk about measuring a vacuum, one micron equals one one thousandth of a millimeter of mercury. 1,000 microns equals one millimeter mercury. One micron equals one twenty-five four hundredths inch of mercury. So the best message to measure 
A vacuum is an electronic vacuum gauge, analog digital light emitting diode, or a U-tube tube manometer. The top one is the best. You want to use an electronic vacuum gauge that measures microns. Some of the new gauge sets actually have these built into the gauges, and that's really nice. Systems should le reach at least 250 microns if there are no leaks in the system. So the vacuum gauge, this is one that has LEDs, okay? This doesn't have a digital readout. But you basically have a hose to the system, you have a power switch, and you have a vacuum indicating LEDs. The vacuum pump is normally a two-stage vacuum pump that produces the lowest vacuum. The EPA mandates systems reach at least 500 microns during evacuation. Very low vacuums can cause moisture inside a sealed system to boil to a vapor, which is then removed by the pump and released to the atmosphere. Remember, moisture is one of the worst things you can have in your refrigeration system. So this is just an example of a vacuum pump, it has an oil sight glass on the side, has a vacuum pump inlet, has a handle, and then has vacuum pump outlet. Most of the time that's through the handle. Don't let the vacuum pumps roll over in your van or in your car because the oil will actually flow out of the vacuum pump. Deep vacuums are measured in the 250 to 50 micron range. Once proper micron levels are reached, the vacuum pump is valved off. When the system pressure is reduced to the required vacuum level and remains constant, that's the key, no non-condensable gas or moisture is left in the vacuum. So again, that last one is very important. When you're doing a vacuum and an evacuation of a system, this may take a while to do. You're going to run the vacuum pump for quite some time. You're going to shut your gauge handles and you're going to watch the pressures. It, the pressures are going to rise. You're going to put your system back on the vacuum pump and continue the vacuum until you can shut your gauge handles and there's no pressure rise in the system. Checking for a leak in a system by watching to see if the pressure rises on a vacuum gauge is not a recommended leak protection procedure. However, if there is a leak during the above mentioned problem, air is allowed to enter into the system. So if you cannot maintain a 500 micron vacuum, okay, it is very possible something is leaking. Just a recommendation. If you do a leak check and have this problem, check your gauge hoses. Sometimes they have small leaks in them that can actually drive you insane to find. This method only proves that the system will not leak under pressure. Okay, now, it is very important a couple things to remember. Do not start a hermetic compressor while it is in a deep vacuum. Applying heat to the compressor while in a vacuum will help remove water that may be trapped under the oil. So if you're working in a cold environment and your compressor does not have a um, crankcase heater, sometimes putting a little bit of heat with a heat gun, not with a, um, not with a torch, don't do that, you'll melt the windings, but sometimes heat gun or hot water or something like that, it will actually help remove the water that may be trapped in the oil. Gauge manifold with large ports and hoses help speed the evacuation process. You'll see sometimes in the field that there are gauges out there that have a large center vacuum line that's specifically designed to help speed that evacuation process. Schrader stem depressors can be removed from gauge hoses to reduce evacuation times. In your low loss fittings, there's a Schrader core depressor. While I do not recommend this approach, some people do remove them when you're doing a vacuum to help evacuation time. However, there's a downside to that. Eventually, you have to take your hoses off, and that can cause leakage. Systems with Schrader valves take longer to evacuate than systems with service valves. Okay, refrigeration systems mainly have service valves. They're much faster. The Schrader core actually interferes with system evacuation. Field service valves sometimes are used to replace Schrader valve stems while the system is under pressure. Schrader valve caps should be put back on the valves after service. 
Hoses can have pinhole leaks and slow down the evacuation process. Use, using copper tubing for gauge lines will help eliminate evacuation problems. Again, though, you do have other issues that go along with that, like they can't be coiled up. Check system valves to verify they're open before evacuation. Closed valves can actually trap air in the system. You want the low and the high side to be as clear as possible between the compressor and the metering device. If you have a system with a hot gas defrost, energize those solenoid. Energize the liquid line solenoids to make sure you don't have any trapped air any place along the way. Because if you have trapped air, you're going to have a problem later. When you're using dry nitrogen, okay, you can sweep dry nitrogen through a sealed system. It keeps the atmospheric atmosphere out of the system. It helps clean the piping of the system. Do not pressurize the system with pressures that are above the system test pressures. Again, that first step of leak checking is to make sure you understand the system test pressures. Never start a system that is pressurized with nitrogen. Nitrogen is a non-condensable, non-compressible gas. When you have a dirty system that has had an acid problem or burnout of a compressor, there's a formation of acid, soot, and sludge. Okay, it's created by heat that causes refrigerant and oil to break down. It cannot be removed from a system with a vacuum pump, and the fumes can be toxic. Safety goggles and gloves should be worn. The way you do this is you um, leave your hose off the. Um, you can leave your hoses off the low side or the high side of the system, and you can actually blow nitrogen through the system. Sometimes this does require you remove the metering device and connect the two lines together to get a clear shot to the evaporator. Okay, you're not really pressurizing the system, but you're actually blowing nitrogen or sometimes another refrigerant through the system. So that's the leak test and evacuation port. We are going to next talk about vacuum pumps as well.